Of all the drugs in the world, Datura is said to be the scariest. It is a highly poisonous plant which induces a terrifying delirium in anyone that consumes it. Its users are barraged with frightening hallucinations with no ability to tell reality from imagination. The whole plant is also highly toxic and taking too much can easily result in death. Given these dangers and the guaranteed bad trips, it's surprising that anyone would ever take this drug, but it seems some people are crazy enough to try it. Some have even shared their experiences online. I've taken five horrifying Dachora trip reports from the website Erowid to read for this video. Please remember that this is not an endorsement of drug taking. As you will see from these experiences, taking Dachora is a very bad idea. This one was written by Tech22. When I was 18, I was in a strange place in the world. I was homeless, penniless, and with no real ambition to pull myself out of the gutter. Although I was without the basic necessities of food and shelter, I had a steady supply of drugs that were dispensed out of sympathy by many of my friends. I went to sleep hungry and cold every night, but never sober. One evening, before I left the party to hit the streets and find a broom closet or stairwell to lay my head, a guy I barely knew gave me a large freezer bag full of brown spiky pods. What are these? I said. Jimson weed. The seeds will make you trip. Maybe you can sell them. I don't want them. He told me to split the pod open and eat half of the seeds if I really wanted to trip hard. To me that meant eat the whole pod, since I always found recommended dosages to be unsatisfying. I chose not to dose that night, since I was already tired and afraid that I might fall asleep before the trip kicked in. I slept in a building gutted by fire a few years before, and the freezing November air woke me up just before dawn. I got up and walked into town to raise my body temperature and avoid hypothermia. This was my daily morning ritual. Obviously 5am in a small city offers very little in the terms of recreation, so I decided it was the right time to open the doors of perception and began my day with a psychedelic breakfast. I chose the largest pod in the bag, which was also the darkest in colour. I was told afterwards that the most potent seeds are the deepest brown. The seeds were terribly bitter and many of the shells got stuck in my teeth. I managed to finish the entire pod with a little help from a public water fountain. I watched the beautiful sunrise from the roof of an apartment building, constantly waiting for the effects of the Jimson weed to take effect. I can't say how long I sat until the seeds started working, but the first noticeable signs came in the form of extreme thirst and general physical discomfort. Finding the feelings of dehydration too strong to ignore, I went to a nearby McDonald's for free ice water. It must have been after 9 because the only people in the restaurant were old guys getting free refills on senior citizen discounted coffee. I sat in a booth at the back corner, sipping water through a cracked straw. It didn't take long for me to realise I was entering into a very hallucinogenic trip. The fact that I hadn't eaten a real meal in a week and I was sleep deprived probably added to the drug's intensity, but I can't imagine a big dinner and a full 8 hours would have made much difference. Unlike the onset of an E or an acid trip, my mental state was very comfortable but my physical condition felt quite unhealthy. The heavy sense of inebriation was quickly followed by powerful disorientating visuals. Although they weren't disturbing, they seemed as clear as sunlight. Black cats milled around on the floor in front of me, so numerous that I couldn't even see the tiles. They appeared wet and angry. There was deep crimson blood dripping from the ceiling. Everything was technicolor. The sense of detachment was strong, but I didn't feel strange. Every hallucination flowed into the next. I was holding a very old bible in my lap, I couldn't figure out how to open it. Soon it started to leak blood too. The more I struggled, the more it bled. As soon as I realised my efforts were futile, the book materialised into the air around me. It didn't seem strange to me. When I analysed the room again, it was a bustling, futuristic metropolis. It appeared very large and very alien, with shining chrome and flashing lights everywhere. I began to feel discomfort and a strong urge to urinate simultaneously. I staggered into the bathroom and vomited in the closest urinal, right in front of an Amish man. Now I live in south central Pennsylvania, so it's very possible that he was really there, but considering my state and other people's accounts of Dachora-induced visuals, I suspect he was just a hallucination. 
I do know that I relieved myself somewhere in the bathroom and left through the side exit adjacent to the lavatory door. The street outside was a scene of World War II ravaged Europe. I don't know which country, but everyone on the street was garbed in Nazi military uniform. I felt very threatened. I ran into the alley behind the parking lot and I hid behind a pine tree. The anxiety soon ebbed, but the thirst and need to urinate soon returned. I knew I needed a comfort zone, a place I could relax in. A friend lived nearby, I walked to his apartment complex and stood in front of the stairwell. The same crimson blood from the McDonald's was cascading down the steps. It began to rise over my shoes and up my legs. A heavy sense of vertigo came over me. There's a memory gap between the stairs and my friend's apartment, but I ended up on his couch watching dolphins dive through the wall in an endless seamless loop. During my time there, I experienced the typical non-existent cigarette search and the disappearing person puzzle. I visited the bathroom many times, but eliminated very little. The sense of dehydration was unbearable, there was no comfort. I didn't recognise the people in the room. I asked the person closest to me where Bill was. Bill's not here, was the reply. I closed my eyes to escape the growing sense of panic, but when my eyelids shut, all I saw was a new room with new people. Where was I? I tried to reopen my eyes, but it only revealed another room with yet more strangers. This went on and on. I didn't know if my eyes were open or shut. I didn't know where I was, what time it was, or what was happening. My panic turned into sensory collapse. Everything bled together and I felt a deep spiralling sensation engulf me. I lost all visual capabilities, but I still had a very real sense of touch. I was trapped in a small metallic box. It made perfect sense to me. I was dead. This was hell. There were no demons, no hellfire or brimstone, just a deep, complete feeling of darkness and hopelessness. This was the never-ending void. Not at all how I imagined it, but worse than I thought it could ever have been. I've had feelings of infinite emotion on acid trips, and sensations of universal truth in K-holes, but this was the most profound reality I had ever experienced. My whole existence was put into perspective, and I was being punished for wasting the gift of life. I blacked out at some point in the box, and woke up in my friend's apartment the next day. He said I was out for around 8 hours. The physical effects wore off a day later, but the psychological impression has yet to fade. Dachura is boundless. Dachura is powerful beyond words. Dachura is poison. This report was written by Concerned Bud. A friend of ours, let's call him Rich, drank a tea brewed from Dachura flowers that were growing in a neighbour's yard. He had been warned that it was a bad idea. Let me preface this by saying that before he consumed this tea, he was a reasonably rational person, although he was considered somewhat eccentric and was attending Macquarie University at the time. The tea had been brewed at Sydney and we lived about 15 miles away. At about 2am in the morning, Rich showed up in his underwear at our door, babbling about his mother needing money for a holiday. We looked outside and saw a cab waiting. I went outside and asked the cabbie what was going on. He told me that our friend had hailed him at Hyde Park in the city centre and asked to be taken to our place. He had been babbling incoherently and the cabbie felt sorry for him. I paid the cabbie for the ride and went inside. Rich started saying that his room was the living room and that he wanted all the people to leave so that he could something or the other. Let's just say it was nonsense, because there was only three of us there. After about 60 minutes of babbling, he went into the kitchen where he was talking to the tea tin whilst shaking his fist violently at the refrigerator. He mysteriously turned and went out the back door, then started talking to the orchids. We were considering taking him to the hospital, but led him into the spare bedroom and watched him overnight. He remained in a weird state for at least another 24 hours. My girlfriend took a day off work to watch him. After he stopped babbling, he became very quiet and would not talk to anyone. We later learned that he had visited several other people during that night, mysteriously leaving at some point. No one knows how he got to Hyde Park. He did strange things such as pulling out his penis and investigating it closely for hours, pretending to be eating and drinking things, talking to inanimate objects, the list goes on and on. The sad thing is, that after this episode, he became psychotic and refused to talk to anyone for about two years. His life was ruined. 
and he wandered around from friend's house to friend's house, looking for food and shelter. He effectively became a hobo, disappearing for months on end. After a few years, he began talking to people and learned what had happened. He was very ashamed, but still remained somewhat psychotic. He has never returned from that holiday. This experience was written by Samwise. I've been meaning to submit this experience for a while, as this was probably the craziest drug encounter I ever had. I'm a bit of a drug veteran, even back then, particularly with psychedelics. It was the summer after graduation. I had a lot of money and a carefree attitude. One fateful day, my friend Drew and I met a friend, Jay, by chance in a park. He told us about how his cousin had given him some kind of strange plant and you can apparently trip out from it. I was up for pretty much anything, minus heroin and meth. I had vaguely heard of Jimson weed before, but wasn't very knowledgeable about it. We said sure and drove to Jay's house. First we smoked a joint, and then we divvied up the two pods between three of us. The seeds were little, clear, and somewhat bitter. We decided we didn't want to waste any of the plant, so we brewed a tea with the shells and drank it. Then we peeled off the inside skins of the pods and ate that. Finally we smoked the outer shell, then we smoked another joint. During the first 20 minutes, nothing too noticeable happened. Colours seemed more vibrant, and my throat was getting kind of dry. When I went to the bathroom to pee, very little actually came out. Jay decided that we should go to a nearby park, as his parents would be coming home soon. As we were walking to the park, basically I felt the effects of being poisoned. I had jello legs, and my eyes wouldn't focus on anything specific for very long. When we got to the park, we walked over, and basically slumped down at a picnic table. At this point my throat was painfully dry. We had a jug of water which I kept drinking voraciously. Then some girl came and sat down at the table and started talking to us. I don't remember what she said to us. Jay said he had to go home and we thanked him for the Dechora. Drew suggested we leave too and we got in the Montero and left. Then the unadulterated insanity began. We left at about 4pm. We pulled up at Drew's house around 9 to 9.30 with no memory of what happened in between. None at all. As we pulled into Drew Street, we noticed a lot of our friends' cars lined up around his house. There appeared to be a party going on. We assumed it had something to do with Drew's brother. As we pulled into his driveway, the neighbor's cat ran right in front of us. We felt a bump and knew Drew had just run over it. He felt really bad about it. We walked inside and sure enough there was a party going on. We see about 20 or so of our friends drinking, laughing and being loud. There were also strangers. Drew excused himself and went into his room as he felt bad about the cat still. I was talking to some friends and I noticed my friend Preston was crying blood. It looked like eyeshadow, a blood circle around his eyes. It was horrifically bizarre and he looked like he was in pain. Are you okay? I asked but he just stared at me with an almost evil gaze, blood dripping from his face to the floor. I saw grotesque people I didn't recognise, who looked like sloth from the Goonies, but not in a comical way at all. They looked deformed, bruised, beaten and burned as they shuffled around the house. Some were laughing manically, some crying, others just staring. It was unsettling to say the least. Things were also painted on like it was a dream. There were burnt cigarettes and tacks sticking sharp side up on the ground, and bizarre looking plants pasted to the walls and doors. Then I saw people with beet red skin crying blood. They looked like what you would expect demons to look like, just like every fairy tale or myth or religious text makes them out to be, minus perhaps the wings. None of this seemed particularly odd to me at the time. I was confused who they were, but I wasn't gripped with fear like I probably would have been if I was sober. Some of these entities were having passionate, crazy sex in the back room, but they didn't look as if they were enjoying themselves. I kept hearing the sound of doors slamming. I met the spirit of the plant, Queen Tula Ashi, as she is known indigenously and shamanically. She was pale, not just albino pale, but literally skin tone like the moon, and imperious. She was also fond of tricks. I talked to her for a bit, though I will not share the conversation, as I feel by doing so is disrespectful. I sat on the floor, still noticing the tacks, which shimmered in my peripheral vision. My friend Chloe walked in through the kitchen, looking frail, beaten and toothless. She explained that a group of Mexicans had just beaten and gang raped her. 
I looked over at a towel in a clear cylinder on a table. Only I didn't see the towel. I saw a talking head, and the head was Chloe's. She was crying hysterically, and Tol Ashi told me to give her a hug, which I did. I was literally hugging a beach towel in plastic. She gut-wrenchingly yelped, and then started crying. At this point I honestly didn't know what to do, but my bladder felt like I was going to explode, so I said I'd be back and went downstairs to the bathroom. Drew's mom was playing solitaire on the computer and said hello to me. I waved and went into the bathroom. Chloe was sitting in the corner of the ceiling, laughing scarily. When I walked to the toilet, Chloe was standing in my way. Chloe, can you please move? I have to pee like a racehorse. She just stared for a second and laughed. Chloe, if you don't move, I'm going to pee on you. She just laughed again louder. So that's what I tried to do. Again, almost nothing came out, but I did feel better. I went back upstairs. My dad was there randomly. He opened the front door and said, Come on, kid. Let's went. All right, I thought. I went outside. He was nowhere to be found. I did see my friend Tom, though, in an orange car parked right outside. He beckoned me to get in. I couldn't. The door was locked. He kept waving me inside. I can't, I said. Then Tom started laughing, and this actually irritated me. Forget it, I shouted at him. I was confused where my dad went, so I sat by myself on the curb. The house across the street had a wood stove top chimney on the roof, but I saw someone committing suicide by hanging themselves instead. It was like an animated gif. When my eyes moved at all, it would reset. When they stayed focused, the man walked off the roof with the noose and hung there, waving in the breeze. I glanced at Drew's Montero and saw possibly the scariest thing out of the whole experience. There was a pale creature with no eyelids, with the most piercing stare I had ever seen in my entire life, sitting in the front passenger seat. His head was shaped almost like a shark's, pointing at the top, and he had no lips and sharp, shark-like teeth. In fact, he looked exactly like the Hellraiser character Butterball, minus the sunglasses, and paler. Just like in the movie, he said nothing. This powerful entity was the only one I couldn't look at straight in the face. I tried to avoid his gaze the entire time. I looked at the tree in the front yard, and I could see a ghostly essence in the tree itself. Actually, I could see the essence of all plant life. Chloe was right by that tree, falling over. I rushed to go help her, but she was painted onto a tall piece of grass, blowing flimsily in the wind. I needed to pee again, I went inside through the garage, and somehow Chloe had beaten me there, and was crying on a coat rack. I don't want to live anymore, she cried, and it was apparent to me that she was hanging herself. Chloe, no, I said, and reached to bring her down. It wasn't Chloe, it was just a coat. I went to the upstairs bathroom and the light didn't work, and the darkness seemed to make the vision stronger. The toilet seat was swirling, and it was fairly hypnotising. I also saw what looked like a ghost or a shadow creature on the floor next to the toilet, outlined by a translucent silver. He was completely two-dimensional, and appeared to be asking for my help, though I couldn't actually hear what he was saying. I finally peed, at least more than I had yet, and felt immensely better, though I felt sorry for the shadow creature. It was kind of a dusty bathroom, and there were glowing insects attracted to the dust. They looked like ants, mini spiders, and other insects which probably don't exist, and they looked bioluminescent. I put my finger on the ground and let one crawl onto my finger. I examined it more closely, and its movements were exactly like a bug's would be. It had feelers, and was feeling me. I clamped my fingers together lightly, and the insect crumbled like dust, its legs floating spirally to the ground. I went back downstairs, and Tul Ashi, still on the couch, asked, did you see the life upstairs? I nodded and looked around. Demons and deformed burn victims were still walking around nonchalantly. I went upstairs to Drew's room to see how he was doing. He was watching TV with Mike, then we noticed the neighbour's yard via the window. There was a four-legged dog creature, very large and very black with glowing red eyes, sitting on what looked like a throne on the side of the swimming pool. There were many people basically having a blood orgy, and massive amounts of steam were rising from the water. There were also dead squirrels which littered the ground, and all throughout the branches of a large tree were squirrel tails hanging like evil Christmas ornaments. The dog, who I later found out is the second spirit associated with Dechora, is known sometimes as the Guardian or Protector, and protects Tolaashi. He noticed us and beckoned us to come and join them beyond the fence. Drew grabbed his binoculars and scoped out the scene. 
people were still having insatiable sex through a bunch of mist. However, with the binoculars, we saw everything in grave detail. I could see the hair on this demonic dog and the squirrel tails and everything in clear, high def detail. Me and Drew saw the same thing. Drew left to get a closer look, the dog and its associates still beckoning us in. Drew went to the fence line and I stayed upstairs watching with the binoculars. Drew almost jumped the fence to join them, but I tapped on the window and shook my head. He came back up. We were tired and wanted to go to sleep. Drew had bunk beds and Mike called the top bunk. I said fine, but I asked her at least to give me a sleeping bag. I didn't actually sleep and got up around 7.30. I decided to read up on the chora, only when I got to the computer to do so, I couldn't read. My vision was okay, but when I tried reading text smaller than billboard size, it was out of focus. This lasted for two more days, and during this time I thought I was never going to be able to read again. In fact, the trip lasted altogether for three days, and the residues of it, like my eyes playing tricks on me, lasted for almost two weeks. I'll cut the other two days out. I shall summarise some of it though. Everyone was worried about us. They thought we were never coming down, and to be fair, neither did we. We saw Dr. Zeus creatures in trees. Elves, gnomes, dwarves, pixies, demons, golems, all kinds of mythical, demonic and spiritual creatures. Everything that Drew saw, I saw, and vice versa. We ran over a ghost with a car. Digital clocks would make Tamagotchi-like animations. It looked 8-bit. I omitted much of what happened, largely because of length, and largely because much of what I experienced I consider sacred. Tolaashi still visits me periodically in my dreams. All in all, I'm glad I experienced this, and I learned much, particularly about the nature of reality. This experience was written by Lucky. I'm in my mid-thirties and I've tried many different things in my time. LSD, mescaline, mushrooms, etc. I would call myself experienced with hallucinogens, which were always fun for me when I was younger. This experience was not one of those times. I must mention that I was trying to make a very light dose just to see what the effects would be. I didn't intend to become incapacitated. Although I tried to document my experience exactly, I soon realised that this was an impossibility. Here is what I do know. 11am, I boiled exactly 10 leaves, about 6 to 8 inches long, in 8 cups of water for 10 minutes. This was my first time with this plant, and I didn't want to overdo it. I took it off the burner and let it steep for a few minutes. As it was cooling, I made a pitcher of really sweet tea from concentrated dry tea mix. Then I filled a 20 ounce glass with ice and filled the cup halfway with tea. Then I filled the rest of the glass with the leaf brew. I ended up using only about 6 to 8 ounces of the brew. I drank the tea all at once. It tasted quite nasty, even though it was heavily sweetened. It only took me a few minutes. Then I removed the leaves from the pot and threw them away. And the pot with the remaining brew I put back on the stove. 11.45, I started to wonder if I'd had enough. I thought it was a good idea to take another glass, so I did exactly as before, and drank it quickly. This time I noticed it was a little hard to get down, almost as if my throat was closing up, making me feel like I was choking. I started to walk back to the couch, and realised I felt funny, like my body was drunk, but my mind was perfectly coherent. From this point on I can't tell you the exact timing of anything else, although I didn't realise it yet, I had lost track of all time and reality. Around 12ish, oh shit, I'm totally wasted. I'm sitting on the couch and I notice things are really strange. Corners of the walls turning into spider webs, very blurry vision. I was watching TV but realised I couldn't really see what was happening or understand what they were saying. I forgot to mention that I was alone, for now. My wife and daughter were due back late that afternoon. I never intended to get this messed up so I decided to get up off the couch and go to the bathroom. I realised then that it would take every effort, almost Herculean strength just to get off the couch. Finally I got up off the couch and stumbled to the bathroom and caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. The first thing I noticed was that my eyes were completely dilated. Then I looked down at my hands. I had a hard time focusing, but when I finally did, I realised that they were beet red. I mean red. Worse than the worst sunburn that you've ever seen. I looked back up at my face in the mirror and I finally came into focus again. I realised that my face looked the same. Now I'm freaking out. My whole body was red, from head to toe. I need to mention at this point that I still felt like I was there mentally. All I noticed were these physical problems. Completely dilated pupils, inability to focus, beet red skin. 
I decided I better try and puke up whatever I could so I tried, but only a little came up. More like an acid reflux type of thing, except now I have a bigger problem. My throat is closing up. Breathing was difficult and I had a dry mouth like never before. No amount of water would satisfy it. Every time I tried to drink, I felt like I was going to choke. Although I thought at the time my mind was still rational, I realised later that I was far from rational. Even still, I calmly went to my computer to look up websites and try to find out if there was any way to reverse the effects I was having. Somehow I made it to a site, but then I realised I couldn't read it. Every word on the page was gibberish. It didn't make any sense. I knew the answer was somewhere, but I couldn't find it. Looking back, I estimate I spent hours at the computer staring blindly at the screen. At the time, it felt like minutes. I went outside to smoke a cigarette and realised I couldn't see anything outside. It was way too bright, so I came back in quickly. I then thought about how fucked up I was and that I need to warn my daughter of the danger of this drug. I went into a room and started to lecture her about the danger of drugs and to never try it and to pick good friends and so on. I remember thinking how good she was being. She sat there quietly and listened to me intently. When I thought I made my point, I got up to leave and realised that she had left the room. I was pissed. How could she just walk away like that? I went out into the living room to complain and realised that she wasn't there. Nobody was there. I was still all alone. I remember feeling at this point like I'm in trouble. What have I been doing? I must note that I still had some of the symptoms I had earlier. The most troubling being I had stumbled everywhere I went. My body was still beat red and I choked every time I tried to drink something. I wondered how long it had been. I don't remember exactly what time it was when I looked, but I realised it was a lot longer than I thought. I recall thinking my family should be home soon. I realised later that I lost several hours. Doing what, I don't know. Then they came home. All of a sudden there she was, my wife, and boy did she look pissed. After what happened earlier though, I didn't believe it was actually her. This part of the story is now her recollection of what she came home to. She said she came home, opened the front door, and smoke came pouring out of the house. She ran to notice that the stove was on fire. There I was just standing, looking off into space. She was screaming at me. What the hell is wrong with you? I remember saying nothing was wrong, but she says I was mumbling something about how she needed to get off my back and go to bed. Then I saw my daughter run by and thought what's wrong with her? I didn't realise then but she was scared shitless about what was going on. Then they left, or had they ever been there I wondered. I decided to go for a smoke. Then after what seemed like a few minutes, which was actually hours, they came back. We have pets by the way too, three dogs and a cat. When they came home the second time, all the animals were gone and the door was wide open. Now she was really pissed. She screams at me about almost burning the house down and how all the pets are gone. I told her she was nuts and to get off my back, then they both left again. Damn, I thought, were they even here? I spent the rest of the night on the computer, mostly just staring at the monitor. I woke up the next morning on the couch and had to talk with my wife. I still felt funny, but the worst was over. So this is what really happened. My wife and daughter came home about 5.30pm to find the stove on fire. She put out the fire. I must have taken the leaves out of the garbage and tried to make more tea. The stove was scorched. I think I drank more tea but I can't be certain. She drilled me about what was going on. She said I wouldn't tell her and kept telling her that everything was cool. She didn't realise I was as bad off as I was. She was more mad than anything. So she and my daughter took off and came back about 8.30pm. She found me on the computer and screamed this time to say that I had lost the pets. I could go on and on with more details, but I don't want you to miss the point. I could have burned to death in the house. I could have choked to death, heart attack. I could have easily died. Those things didn't happen, but I'll tell you what did. It's been two months since this happened and I'm still not the same. I hate to say it's permanent. I hope not. But the truth is, I've screwed myself up. My throat is still partially closed. I have trouble breathing when I sleep. I cough up liquids sometimes, because it tries to go down my windpipe. I still see shit that's not there, but worst of all is my brain. I can't maintain my thoughts. I'm a writer but I can't focus anymore. It took me forever to write this. This report was written by Craig. I'll start with a little background. This is a detailed report of a trip that spans the course of three days. I'm not 100% sure of the details of the trip, as I can't recall everything. Clues I found in my house after the trip helped though, 
and chronologically, the story is quite accurate. A friend and I have been into serious drugs for years now. We'll call him Chris. Between the two of us, we've tried nearly every drug that could be even slightly considered recreational. Drugs many of you have likely never even heard of. Then came inevitability, deliriance. The day finally came where there were just no drugs left to try, and after reading extensively, we turned to deliriance. It was all we had left to try. We meticulously grew and picked datura plants that had been grown and cultivated over an indeterminate length of time. The day came when the plant was ready to be ingested. We separated a significant portion of seeds, 600 apiece. Looking back, the dose was absolutely ridiculous, and we are very, very lucky to be alive. I should be a dead man right now. The mentality behind the dose was something along the lines of, we're too experienced not to do this much, and our bodies are too used to drugs. Essentially, we were too tough for Tachora, and thus took a very stupid dose and a very stupid risk. Day 1. Jen, a friend of mine, came over to sit with us. We ingested 600 seeds each as quickly as possible and washed them down with a glass of milk. Then we locked all the doors and windows to my house as to prevent any drug-induced rampages, police run-ins or worse. Chris and I plopped down in front of my new big screen and we began watching a movie. About an hour into it, I started feeling the effects. The dry mouth came on as in other trip reports. I had no idea it would be this strong. My legs felt like rubber and my body was completely out of whack. I looked over to Chris to tell him it was kicking in and I found even this simple task disorientating. He confirmed the same experience thus far. In what was the stupidest move of the century, Jen decided she was bored and that she would take 150 seeds. Now she's had her experiences with drugs before, but she was our sitter. As time passed, it seemed to stretch. Much like a DXM trip, I lost all reference of time. The only indicator was a digital clock, which would have been impossible to read if it weren't for the large readout. The movie had since finished, and the television was airing some show about cops. I honestly couldn't tell you what it was that I was watching, but all the lights and colours melded into this visual supernova that I couldn't stop staring at. Chris grunted strangely, and I looked over to see him sliding off the couch. I became frightened because at this very moment the room had vanished. We were stranded on a couch in a burning hallway. I grabbed Chris and pulled him back onto the couch so that he wouldn't get burned. He looked at me with his massive pupils and spoke an unrecognisable string of words. Time slowed as he spoke. His voice echoed in slow motion and his pupils expanded beyond his eyes, spiralling towards me. I was intrigued at what I was seeing when Jen grabbed my shoulder from the other couch. She was engulfed in flames and ran from the couch up into my bedroom. I laid on my bed trying to make sense of everything when I saw a man looking in through the window. Unable to make out his face, I was frightened. It was dark outside and I was on the second floor. Impossible, but I believed it. Jen opened the door to my room. She was shouting something and laid next to me. Her face twisted and turned as I stared and I couldn't remember where we were. I must have blacked out because three hours had passed and I was still lying with Jen in my bed, only we were now both naked. Did we have sex? Why was I naked? What happened? I had no explanation, but somehow I didn't seem to need one. We tried to have sex, which was weird in itself since we had never so much as kissed before this. I was too far gone to know what I was doing, and then it went black again. I came to, sprawled on the bedroom floor. I was now by myself. I noticed a residue on my body, leading me to believe that we had sex, but Jen was nowhere to be found. I walked into the kitchen looking for her, but there was no kitchen beyond my bedroom door. I'd stepped into a supermarket, only it was closed and there was no food on the shelves. I ran back downstairs into the TV room where I'd last seen Chris. The room was black. I saw nothing but a body hovering in midair. It was Chris and he seemed to be sleeping. I decided I needed a cigarette. Interestingly enough, I had one in my ear at the time. I smoked it and took another one from my now reloaded ear. Where were these coming from? I grew tired, but I still hadn't found Jen. I walked upstairs, and immediately upon opening the door, I needed to lie down. I thought I was in some kind of endless field, and that I was sleeping on the grass. There I slept for almost 20 hours. I awoke still hallucinating. I didn't know where I was or how I had gotten there, but it seemed to be a house that wasn't my own. 
I proceeded into the living room to come across a naked woman. She sat in the chair, talking to nobody. When I entered the room, she saw me and immediately took off running. Where did she go? Who was she? I needed to leave. I was in a strange house and I was stuck. I ventured into what I thought was a bedroom. It turned out to be a balcony. On the balcony, I found a man's clothing, but no man. Were these mine? I looked out into the backyard, and there on the ground was a man, naked. Somebody had fallen. Luckily, they'd landed in the water. I proceeded into the next room, intrigued, as if I was investigating some deserted mansion. A radio hummed, though I saw no radio. I noticed a sliding glass door to the back and tried to open it. This was a strange door and I couldn't seem to open it. I felt trapped. I knew it was some kind of illusion. I jumped through it and I was right. There was nothing there and I was finally outside, free from the prison. There was a truck on the side of the road, which I noticed from where I was standing. I decided to hitch a ride and try to get back home. I jumped into the bed of the truck and waited. Shortly thereafter, the driver got in and we were off. I laid still so not to attract attention, when all of a sudden a friend of mine from high school appeared. I hadn't seen him in ages, but he was going to blow my cover. I remembered I was naked and I didn't want him to see. I tried to close my eyes, but he was still there. I shouted and tried to struggle with him, but he disappeared. The truck stopped, I was found out. The driver got out and saw me. He had no facial features, no mouth, no nose, no eyes. I jumped from the bed and began to run, naked and scared. This is my last memory. There's no further evidence as to what happened after this point, but I awoke hours later, finally somewhat sober. I opened my eyes and there were three people staring at me. I was naked, bleeding and covered in my own feces. I huddled in the corner of whatever room I was in. It was a family. They had found me and tried to keep me safe. I was in southern New Hampshire after starting in Maine. I was almost three hours from my home with no recollection of how I got there. The family offered me clothing and enough money to take the bus back home. I returned home to find my house in ruins. The sliding glass door I had imagined was actually my bedroom window. Chris was lying on the ground in my yard after falling from the second floor. He had no clothing on. He was alive, but he broke his leg. I found Jen in my bathtub, still naked and sleeping. My life was hysteria for 48 hours. I'm not sure how all three of us survived that trip. So there's five stories about the horror of taking Dachora. I've actually grown a few different species of Dachora in my garden. Although I'd never ever take it myself, I do like growing poisonous plants. And the flowers are actually really pretty. It's a very interesting plant to grow. I like to read these experiences to remind myself what kind of secrets lie behind its attractive flowers. So I hope you enjoyed these stories. I'll put a link to the trip reports in the description so you could read them yourself. There's many more on Erowid and I recommend having a look through them. Some of them are very entertaining. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you really enjoyed it, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Until next time, goodbye.